Welcome to Dealing with Difficult People at Work, How to Stay Professional When Things Get Ugly, presented by Elite Leadership Coaching by Andrea. I am your host today. My name is Andrea White. I'm a leadership and business coach, and I have the awesome opportunity to work with corporate and nonprofit professionals and small business owners who feel stuck, unclear, are not supported to increase their leadership, intelligence, influence, income, position, and power. And I do that through a number of different ways, courses, workshops, keynote presentations, and most often through one-on-one uh, -on -one coaching. Uh, so today we are going to spend a little time going over a couple of different things. So what causes people to be difficult, what types of difficult people are there? Skills and strategies to handle difficult people. Uh, and then most often, um, I think it's really important to not only uh, learn new things, but also to put a plan into place uh, to learn how to put those new skills or new knowledge really into action. And so we will do just a really uh, brief uh, uh, action planning exercise at the very end. So we are going to go ahead and get started um, by focusing on what does difficult people, you know, what do difficult people look like? Like, what do they, how do they behave? And so it may look like a couple of different things. They may be rude, aggressive, uncooperative, uh, they may attempt to dominate you or others. They may be abrupt and or interrupt others. And so we will spend the next 30 minutes or so talking about uh, uh, strategies on how to deal with uh, these types of behaviors. So why are some people difficult? Uh, so I really want to encourage you to first, uh, as you're interacting with difficult people, to perhaps uh, pose this question to your, yourself first. And so why is this person being difficult? Are they currently under some type of personal or professional stress? And so it's coming out as rude or aggressive, or it may be that they are uh, maybe not communicating at all. They are kind of aloof and withdrawn. Uh, they also may be experiencing a lack of confidence. Uh, and so the difficult person or the person that you're perceiving as difficult may actually, uh, you know, feel like they are in a space where they cannot and will not perform at their best. They may not feel like they have the knowledge and skills to be able to do the job or the task that is being asked of them. And so because they are not confident, uh, they may not communicate well, they may communicate poorly uh, or aggressively. A person may also know for sure that the things that they are being asked to do, that they are unable to do them and so their performance is suffering. And so uh, again, because of poor performance and their awareness of their performance is not, being, is not up to par, it may actually come across as uh, rude, aggressive, abrupt, you know, um, behavior or communication. And then the last thing I want you to think about as you interface with people that may come across as difficult, there are actually some people that know that their rudeness or aggressiveness or difficult behavior actually causes you to feel um, some kind of way. They may actually know that their behavior causes you to get angry, upset, um, and they get a sense of power out of that. And so as you, you know, are working around people that are difficult, I encourage you to think about uh, one or more of these sources as to why some people may be difficult. And then uh, in knowing the why, it may help you in, in determining which strategy 
you're going to use to deal with them. And so the next uh, several slides, we are going to talk about uh, how to respond, different types of response strategies, uh, and overall, how you choose to respond really is based on a number of different things. Your, your position, um, the type of organizational culture you're in, the type of managerial support you may or may not have, the environment that you're in. But nonetheless, we will cover several uh, different types of strategies and solutions uh, that hopefully you'll have enough to choose from in your toolbox to make things a little more easy for you. So there are two things that are really important as we begin. The first is uh, you have uh, the opportunity to decide how you react to the person that you perceive as difficult. And it is really the only thing that you can control, and that is your reaction. And so to be successful with this technique, it's really important to first make up your mind that you will not react explosively with anger or inappropriately. This is really all about mindset and mindfulness. And most of the work to be successful in dealing with challenging people is really done up front. It is not done while you are in the situation with a difficult person. Uh, and so, you, you know, as you are listening to this course, you probably can make a little checklist in your mind about the people um, in your office or even in your personal space that are difficult to communicate with and get along with. And so as you picture those people, I want you to go ahead and make a decision that you will choose to make a better reaction to them when they uh, come across as difficult. The other responsibility that you have is being sure not to get angry, not to fight back and not to demonstrate the same behavior uh, that the person is giving off towards you. Uh, to be successful in not responding with anger or fighting back, remember you have to decide uh, way up front, you know, how you're going to respond. And just as important, whether you're an informal, informal or formal leader, your response is really a great opportunity to model to others your leadership intelligence and your ability to remain calm and to show great self-control. So this is really an opportunity where um, you'll see a lot of times where I talk about prepare, stand out, and elevate. And so as you um, are working with a difficult person, uh, demonstrating great control uh, is an opportunity for you to, to, to stand out and demonstrate your leadership intelligence, whether you're in a formal uh, leadership role or not. So you do not want to get angry, fight back, or demonstrate the same behavior. You want to practice great self-control. The primary goal is to really minimize and neutralize the person's behavior and also your reactions. And so we will go over several strategies to help you to do that. So at this point, a couple of key things to keep in mind. A, you wanna make sure that you um, make up your mind how you're gonna respond. Uh, and then you are going to focus on minimizing and neutralizing the person's behavior as well as your response. Okay, so how are you gonna do that? There are a couple of different techniques I want you to um, take into consideration. The first is to review what's happening. Does the behavior happen regularly or is the person having an off day, a bad day? If it's a reoccurring issue, then taking steps to address are needed. And we'll talk about how to do that in just a little bit. If it is unusual, then maybe just for that day, you may just need to give the person some space for the day um, and then, you know, see how the next day is. Um, sometimes people may just be having, you know, an off day. And so you want to take that into consideration. 
The second option I want you to think about um, is, of course, to be calm and to talk with the person uh, in, an, in an assertive manner in private. And that's if you're comfortable addressing the person on your own, then you want to do that in a private setting. You want to give an, um, an ex a specific example or examples of a time when something the person did bother you. And so that may sound something like, yesterday during our staff meeting, I felt like you were being aggressive toward me during our, during our meeting. In the future, I would appreciate your feedback toward me to not be so harsh, abrasive, and critical. This type of communication um, is using I statements, and it's what's considered assertive communication. It is not aggressive. Uh, A, you are speaking to the person in private. B, you're being very specific to the person about the things that, from your perception, are the things that the way that you did not want to be treated or you don't want to be treated and you don't want to be treated as harshly abrasively or critically um and so you are you know sort of putting a boundary into place you're being very clear about the boundary uh and you're giving a very specific example which is always very helpful the third thing I want you to think about is, and I just mentioned it a bit a minute ago, is not to fight with the person, not to argue with the person, but you also don't want to retreat where you pull back, you go silent, um, you withdraw, you know, from you know your presence in the meeting, your communication stops, uh, and so uh, you want to avoid. Those are two extremes, and so you want to avoid those. Uh, if you want to make an uh, impact, you certainly don't want to go to either one of those extremes. You want to stay calm, speak plainly. Um, another example that you may say something like, are you trying to make fun of me? Uh, and something like that may really be especially if you have to say something in the presence of others. Um, it really calls attention to the person's behavior in that particular moment. Uh, and once you ask the question, wait for a response after you have asserted yourself and just be really comfortable with the silence. Uh, either the person will say, no, I wasn't trying to make fun of you or um, I apologize or they will just move on to the next topic. But by saying something, you have alerted them to the fact that you take note of how they are treating you. Uh, and in a way, you're saying that that is not okay. Um, but once you ask the question, it's really important to remain sort of silent until and, and put the ownership on the person to make the next statement and move forward. And then the last thing, a couple of uh, couple of other things you can consider is really depending on your position, your leverage, leverage and control, you can also try what's called behavior modification. And it's actually something that really, um, that a lot of parents use when they're raising their children. Uh, and so when someone acts negatively towards you in the workplace, you can completely ignore them and ignore the behavior. Uh, this sends a message that you won't tolerate the behavior, and then when the person acts more favorably or positively toward you, you know, you just say thank you or give some other positive response. Um, you engage them in a positive way, and then this is also a powerful strategy in a group setting. Uh, when a team is dealing with a difficult team member. So again, a lot of the strategies that we'll be talking about are really just tools in your toolbox and you will pull out whichever tool is applicable for the situation or circumstance that you're in at the moment. You may also need to consider involving your manager uh, if you work through some of the previously mentioned techniques uh, and, and things haven't changed, then it may be time to involve your manager. Uh, you wanna meet with your manager in private 
you want to share some specific examples, perhaps you've kept a log or a journal of your interactions with the person, the difficult person. And so you, you know, have some, you know, very concrete, specific things that have happened that you can share with your manager. Uh, and you want to provide concrete actions you would like to see happen. Uh, you want to remind your manager that you are excited uh, about showing up as an engaged, productive team member every day and that the difficult person's behavior is beginning to make that more challenging. And then it's the leader or the manager's responsibility to do what's necessary um, to create a, a positive, engaging uh, workspace. If the difficult person actually works in a different department, then you still want to talk with your manager first and work with uh, him to determine the best next steps. Uh, and so what I'm asking you not to do is talk to the difficult person's manager if they are in another department first. You always want to engage with, with your manager first and let her know what's going on. And then you, the two of you work together to figure out what to do next. And really, unfortunately, if none of these things happen, uh, you can you know, consider transferring within the company away from the person are leaving the company altogether. And those are really drastic um, solutions. Um, but if you're being impacted in a very serious, major way, and you're miserable, and perhaps even if your health is being affected, then that may be um, some option, you know, an option you may need to consider because your physical and mental health are priority. Um, and, and speaking of, you know, your physical and mental health, I, I thought it was really important to talk about office bullying because it's such a wild sort of phenomena at this time in our, in our workspaces. Uh, and there really comes a time when unpleasantness crosses over into bullying, which is uh, defined as repeated health harming mistreatment and is reported to often be directed at really the brightest and best in an environment or team setting. Uh, not uncommon. Um, in 2017, 19% of US workers experienced bullying firsthand and 19% of American workers reported being a witness to bullying. So that's almost 40% of our entire workforce in the United States either being bullied or witnessing bullying. So that's a really large percentage. 70% uh, of the time, bullying perpetrators are men and 60% of bullying targets are women. 29% of targets actually remain silent when they are bullied. 61% of bullies are in a uh, managerial or supervisory position. 71% of employer responses are actually harmful to the person being targeted. So all the more reason to have some of your own appropriate tools in your toolbox to respond to difficult people or office bullies. Um, because quite often at this point, employers aren't necessarily getting it uh, right. 40% of targets experience some type of adverse health effects. And so as a target of bullying, uh, headaches, stomach aches, um, you know, depression um, have been reported. Offensive conduct could include things like threats, humiliation, and intimidation. Um, bullying behaviors can sometimes be some of the same behaviors that we discussed earlier, but it may also include getting in the way of promotion efforts, threats of termination, and the encouragement of others to make unwarranted complaints. Uh, bullies usually come across as confident, assertive, and capable, but really they are more likely to be insecure 
and threatened by their targets. So steps to deal with bullying behavior includes, the first thing I think is really important is really just to call a thing a thing. Uh, you have to admit that you or someone you know is being bullied and that the bully is the problem and not the target. And again, that may be a conversation that you have in private with the person, or if necessary, you may um, discuss it with your immediate manager, uh, a different organizational leader, if it actually is your manager that is demonstrating the bullying behavior, or have a discussion um, with someone in HR. And sometimes, um, just by bringing attention to the matter quickly, uh, that may be enough to take care of the problem uh, sort of quickly and respectfully. Uh, and then last, you wanna take care of your physical and mental health. Um, you wanna take some days off work to rest and recover if necessary. It can be a really traumatic experience, especially if it took you some time to actually call a thing a thing and to bring attention to the issue and to actually uh, address the issue and to get some help. Um, some other sort of extreme things, of course, you can ask to be transferred to a different area until the situation is handled or permanently. Uh, and again, in any communication with the bully, you wanna be assertive and not aggressive. Um, you wanna meet any aggression from the bully with calm and courage, set boundaries and let them know uh, what behavior is acceptable and not acceptable, being consistently firm and determined um, are actually proven strategies to cause a workplace bully to back down. I also thought it was really important to have just a, a little bit of conversation around self-awareness um, because bullies don't just become bullies and not know, you know, that they're bullies. And so self-awareness as a leader is probably one of the key leadership characteristics um, that you want to really focus on and growing and maintaining. And so we want to talk a little bit about making sure that you aren't the unpleasant person or bully in the, in the office. Um, and so sometimes it's really difficult to realize how others perceive us. So it's always important to uh, be really self-aware and to focus um, on growing that skill set. And so as you're, you know, working with people, talking with people, doing team projects, you're in meetings with people, pay attention to the person's body language when they interact with you. Um, you know, you want to avoid making unreasonable requests. You want to make sure uh, that you're not asking people to do things outside of their job duties, especially if you're already in a position of leadership. Um, you know, you want to be aware if people won't look you in the eye when you're interacting with them because that can be a sign of stress or fear. And you want to avoid blaming others. Uh, you don't want to devalue others, other people's opinions and contributions. And so as an informal or formal leader, when people offer up opinions and contributions that may not, you know, necessarily be helpful to the cause, um, you may say something like, great idea, but maybe not such a great fit um, for this particular project. Um, or you may ask other people in the room, you know, what do you, what do you all think about that idea? Um, so that the person can actually hear from another uh, number of people uh, that maybe their opinion or contribution isn't applicable for this particular situation. And then if a person is frequently offering opinions and contributions that are not helpful, then that's probably more of a conversation that you wanna have in private. 
uh, as well so that you all can get on the same page. Maybe the person doesn't really understand the work at hand. And so it's difficult for them to offer up opinions and contributions that are actually helpful. So as a professional, you always want to work toward developing your self-awareness and your emotional intelligence. This helps to ensure that you're always aware of how your words, behavior, and actions affect those around you. And those two, are, two things are really key as a leader. You want to make sure that your words, behavior, and actions affect um, uh, how they affect those around you. And you do that through building and maintaining great self-awareness and emotional intelligence. Now, sometimes what is actually occurring is it is not a difficult person, as we talked about at the very beginning, and the person is not necessarily a bully. It really is more about people, you know, we all have different behaviors and response strategies. And those differences don't necessarily make the person difficult, quote unquote. Different people with different backgrounds, experiences, skills, um, it's important to realize uh, that that is what we get when we show up for work. And just because we have uh, differences in those areas, it's important to remember that when a person behaves differently from you, that doesn't necessarily mean that they are, you know, stressed or poor performance, not confident, or that they are a bully. Um, so what you want to do is to avoid, excuse me, making untrue or negative assumptions about a person's behavior. And most important, you want to avoid responding to them in unhelpful ways based on those assumptions. So for example, uh, you don't want to try to cheer up somebody every day, but they're normally quiet, serious person. Like you just want to, you know, recognize and understand that that person, you know, most days of the week, normally they're quiet and serious. And so it's not about looking at them as weird, different, difficult, um, aloof. That is their personality. And so just, you know, sort of being willing to accept um, that they have just a different um, behavior and response. So there are a couple of different ways that you can work with people who have different um, experiences and behaviors and response strategies. The first one is align uh, you all's working speeds. And this is really probably one of the most common misconceptions about a difficult person. Pace is one of the most common differences between people that leads to frustration and negative assumption. So if you're working with a person whose pace is very different from yours, then you can immediately make the relationship more comfortable by adjusting your pace to match theirs. More often than not, the other person will notice the concession and begin to make adjustments as well. And so hopefully you all will end up somewhere in the middle. <laughs> or you can have a discussion to make an agreement on how to meet each other in the middle. If you're fast paced, then you may agree to speak more slowly, give the other person time to think, and more lead time when assignments are due. And the slower paced person may agree to do more things outside of their typical comfort zone. And so the key is A, to acknowledge that we're all different. Uh, and very frequently we work at different speeds. Um, but perhaps having a very clear conversation about you all's you know, differences and how you can meet in the middle, you all can work together to come up with some agreements. Uh, it's better to do that than to just kind of muddle through and feel frustrated by the difference in speeds and you haven't had a conversation about it. Um, the other thing is, let's talk about starting a relationship or project uh, and, 
you know, so some people are relationship based and some people are task based. So when you start a relationship or a project and you two are different, uh, the difference um, can also be miscategorized as working with a difficult person because you may be more relationship based and they be, may be more task based. And it's not really that either of you is difficult, you all just approach your work and relationships differently. So this difference like pace can lead to a good deal of misunderstanding and discomfort. The solution is when you are first meeting someone, you wanna look for cues about how they would like to get started. If the person gets right down to business, then go with it. And vice versa, if they spend some time asking a few non-related work questions, then go with that. Just as in pace, the other person will make adjustments as well, um, you know, as you all begin to work together. Everyone's style needs are then met. Ultimately, you want to retrain your mind to see some people as different versus that they are the worst or difficult. Uh, and so you first just want to be open to thinking about what could be causing the uncomfortableness that you feel or stress or frustration that you feel. And then based upon um, what you think the issue may be, you may have to do a couple of different things. Decide ahead of time how you're gonna respond to that person, how are you gonna communicate with that person, do you need to talk with that person one-on-one -on -one so you all can get on the same page? Uh, and so what you don't want to do is to avoid the issue, not think about the issue, you know, show up in the space and just respond how you respond. That's just not what leaders do. Okay. Then there are some extreme behavior styles. Um, that you need to be aware of. You need to have these in your toolbox as well. Uh, so you may have some difficult people um, because due to stress, poor performance, lack of confidence, um, you may be dealing with an office bully. You may be dealing with a person who just has a different work style than you. Uh, and you also may be dealing with someone that has what we consider an extreme behavior style. And so I just wanna go over a couple of these with you and then give you some um, best ways to deal with um, the extreme behavior style. So the first one we'll call is nothing people. They are extremely passive um, people. Uh, they seek perfection but nothing measures up, the best way to deal with them is to ask open-ended specific questions, use facts, logic, and structure in your communication and approach to any projects that you're working on together. The second is no people. Negativity appears when others prevent perfection. The best way to deal with them is to let their voice, uh, let them voice their concerns and use them as a resource and then clarify uh, any questions uh, to reduce generalizations. Complainers um, are people when uh, perfection is not achieved, they show their frustration by complaining. In general, they are not equipped to offer suggestions to correct the problem or deal effectively with what they don't like, which can be frustrating within itself. So the best way, or one of the best ways to deal with them is to listen carefully for their areas of concern. And then because you know this person is a complainer, unfortunately, it puts a little bit of pressure on you to um, maybe offer up solutions or put out to the group uh, if the complainers 
sort of complaint is valid or something that really needs to be considered, you may have to put it out to the group for um, possible solutions. Again, it's really about identifying the type of people that you're dealing with and knowing ahead of time how you're gonna deal with it. There are also people that we consider tanks that are motivated by an intense need to get things done and are extremely task oriented. So they just bulldoze through like a tank just to get the job done. And then when obstacles bubble up, they go into full attack mode. Uh, oftentimes, personal tax may actually happen because you are you happen to be in the line of fire. Uh, and so the best way to deal with them is to stand your ground, hold your position, focus on the project, uh, focus on the bottom line, um, and not to get shaken sort of by their um, their demeanor. Then there are snipers who are sarcastic, rude, and exaggerated in their body language. They get frustrated when they cannot control the situation. They are also motivated by grudges that they may actually try to suck you into as well. Uh, the best way to deal with them is to, again, stand your ground, be assertive, ask clarifying questions about their intent, if they bring up, you know, let's do this or let's do that. Um, your question may be, you know, what's the goal? What are we trying to accomplish? So that you are not sucked into something that is not positive in nature. Then there are know-it-alls. They are highly confident, knowledgeable people. They know their stuff. They can be extremely controlling and have no tolerance for correction and differences in opinions. Their way is the right way, the end, period. Um, a, one of the ways to deal with them is to, A, for you to be prepared, to know your stuff. And so when you know that you are going to interface with somebody that is characterized as a know-it-all, it may require you to step your game up a little bit. It may require you to do some additional research, just come ultra prepared to the meetings um, and any projects that you're all working on together. And then really, um, sometimes know-it-alls can make really good mentors if it's um, a subject matter that you need to, to really ramp up your knowledge in. Uh, and so if, the, if a relationship with the know-it-all is tolerable, you may actually also consider asking them to be um, an informal or formal mentor. And then last, um, there are yes people. They have an extreme desire to get along with others. They agree or say yes to almost anything. Uh, they frequently overcommit and then fall short on the results promised. Uh, and so one of the best ways to deal with them is to encourage honesty, assist in making uh, realistic commitments. And so that conversation may sound something like, you know, we have this project due on August 14th. Um, what can you have ready by August 8th? Or what will you have ready by August 8th? Or better yet, you may even say, do you think you can have task A and task B ready by August 8th? Uh, and in that way, it's not like the yes person is making a decision about um, or really committing to something that they're going to fall short on. You can, um, you know, give them an assignment based on what you know their capability is. So along with sort of, you know, tools that you can put forward, um, you know, as an informal or formal leader, there are also expectations and tools for people that are in a formal leadership role. And um, we'll talk about just a few of those as well. And so there isn't a guaranteed way to avoid difficult people. But as you have seen, there are strategies to deal with them, including the responsibilities of leaders, 
to build and maintain an engaged positive environment. Uh, strategies that leaders can do um, include having regular one-on-one -on -one meetings with team members, having regular staff meetings, um, consistently uh, showing appreciation of hard work, and opportunities to discuss where things can be better as offered up by team members. And some other things that leaders have the responsibility of making sure uh, happen include developing defined rules and agreements for behavior. And that is really a great team exercise so that um, the team comes up with agreements uh, together and then uh, discuss in front of one another and um, make a group contract. And another part of that is developing communication channels and materials, and then planning to review and edit those at least on an annual basis. Um, leaders also have a responsibility, big responsibility of not just focusing on the difficult team member, um, not just focusing on the squeaky wheel. Uh, it's important for leaders to also reward and showcase good behavior. Um, frequently negative behavior gets all the attention while good behavior is not acknowledged. And so as a leader, it's important to make sure that there's great balance um, on uh, your squeaky wheel, as well as those that are doing uh, really great, awesome work. Uh, and then leaders also have the responsibility of holding people accountable and responsible for their actions. And so a great strategy, as I mentioned a minute ago, are your one-on-one -on -one meetings. Um, because in those one-on-one -on -one meetings, what should be happening is discussion around successes, challenges, opportunities, um, areas of assistance that the staff member um, needs help with. That should be sort of just the running agenda. And then frequently uh, during those meetings, any challenges with other people um, on your team or not on your team will come up then. And it gives the leader an opportunity to provide support. Um, and so when there is accountability, people are less likely to continue being difficult. Uh, and so if one team member in their one-on-one -on -one says, you know, another team member is giving me a difficult time with X, Y, and Z, when the leader has their one-on-one -on -one meeting with the other team member, they can say, hey, can you tell me more about X, Y, and Z? Are you having any challenges? Um, is there anything that I can help you with? And in that way, everyone's needs have been communicated, addressed, and an offer for support has occurred from the leader. So a couple of summary points as we close out. Uh, difficult people can be stressful and frustrating, but uh, very frequently, we are able to identify those people in our circle, and so it's really important to get our mindset together first, um, know who those people are, and then know how we are going to respond. We want to control our response, um, and in doing so, we're demonstrating great leadership intelligence right out of the gate. If you're comfortable, um, you want to chat with the person privately. And before you do that, you want to make sure that it's not in a, a moment of, of heat and frustration and stress. Uh, you also want to make sure that you have clear examples of the person's behavior uh, that are troublesome. And you also want to have some clear expectations as to how you would like for the relationship to move forward. Um, and then we've covered several different strategies that you can use to neutralize or stop their behavior. And again, it's really about, um, you know, having a number of tools in your toolbox and picking the right tool based on the situation at hand. 
And then also it's important to remember that office bullies are a whole different breed. Uh, with it comes, you know, frequent sort of health effects. It's repeated. Um, it usually involves threats. Uh, and so dealing with office bullies are a little bit different. And so if you're comfortable again, you can certainly have a conversation with the person in private. Uh, if not, you can have a conversation with your manager or another organizational leader if it's actually your manager that is the bully or pull in HR. And before you sort of, you know, assume or label someone as difficult, I want you to consider uh, if the person just has a different work style than you. And if so, then how can you all communicate and work together to find a happy middle ground uh, in how you all um, make your different work styles work together? Uh, and then lastly, leaders have, you know, great responsibility and they are actually, you know, expected to develop and sustain and engage healthy team environment. And so it's really important for leaders to have um, knowledge and awareness of what's going on on their team, how are individual team members doing, if there are any challenges, what are the successes, and then as team members bring up any challenges or uh, you know, ask for assistance, leaders have a responsibility um, to provide that as needed and as they are made aware. Okay, so what's your action plan? I want you to jot down on a piece of paper, fill in these blanks. I want, or need to develop skill in. It could be, you know, identifying the different types of um, work styles. It could be needing to develop skill in um, not fighting back, not retreating. Um, anything that we've talked about in this uh, course uh, what, you know, what can you pick out as a skill that you need to work on? What's something that's really foreign to you or something that you know you don't do really well that would help you in dealing with difficult people moving forward? And then once you, you have identified that skill or skills, give yourself a deadline as to when you will have done it by. And so you may say, I need to develop skill in not fighting back. I will do this by February 20th, 2019. My timeline to start learning more about not fighting back is December 26, 2018. I will begin using my new skill set of not fighting back by January 1, 2019. And uh, I will encourage my cube mate, Susan, to learn this skill as well. Uh, one of uh, the hallmark signs of a leader, whether that's formal or informal, you know, as you learn something new, you know, or you learn a new skill, you wanna bring somebody along with you. And so, as you grow, learn more, learn new skills around leadership, go ahead and pick out, you know, a person or two that um, is open and willing to learning with you. Uh, and so as you sort of step into a formal leadership role or a higher leadership role, uh, I want to encourage you to always think about how you can support people in being better um, over the course of you all's relationship. Okay, so there's your action plan. Fill in the blanks. You can hang that up somewhere to, to keep it in the front of your mind. As a thank you for um, uh, the four course leadership bundle, 
you can uh, click on the link to get 10 actions to a leadership position. It goes beyond uh, the items that are in this four course bundle. So it has actions and tips for other leadership uh, skills that you can put into play to prepare, stand out and elevate. And so that is yours for free. Uh, I also highly encourage you to schedule some time to talk with me. Um, I would love to talk with you more about your leadership development goals and the results possible when we work together, uh, either through some of my one-on-one -on -one intensives or some of my small group courses. Uh, so you can click the link and have immediate access to my calendar and um, we can take some time to do some action planning around your leadership development goals. And I am a social introvert. And so after a training, workshop, keynote presentation, I absolutely have to take a nap. <laughs> um, but uh, when I am not uh, napping, I'm definitely social. So you can reach me on my website, which is the Bentley link at the top. I also have a great Instagram page and Facebook page at Elite Coach Andrea, where I provide um, actionable leadership development tips, skills, um, actions you can take. Um, not very many quotes and memes and things like that, but things that you can actually uh, use immediately. And then if you have any questions, suggestions, or you wanna give some feedback about the course, you can send that to me via email, which is the last line on this slide. Okay, so congratulations on this first step toward elevating your career. Um, by being a part of this four course leadership bundle. So we'll talk soon.